All right, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank you all for coming to City Lights tonight. Uh, we've got Thomas Raincrow here. He's going to present his uh, selected collection of poems from Yvonne Gohl. So please welcome Thomas Raincrow to City Lights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a special night for me because of the book. Um, so I'm going to indulge myself a little bit, and there's going to be some backstory and and some tales about the process of the, that's gone into this Yvonne Gall person that probably most of you don't know about. Um, but I'll just I'll just start by saying that um, he's kind of the Freddie Mercury of the first half of the 20th century. <laughs> now that sounds nuts, but I just watched Bohemian Rhapsody <laughs> last night. <laughs> <laughs> on Netflix and so I've got Freddie Mercury going in my head uh, tonight but no he's he's one of the most important literary figures of the 20th century there's in my mind there's no question but most people don't know about him especially in the English uh, speaking world now he's French German uh, born right on the border between France and Germany he spoke several languages uh, moved around a lot and so there's a lot of reasons why people may not know about him because you can't fit him into a, a simple particular niche or um, slot, literary or otherwise. Um, so the the story, the, the back story. Here's the book. It's the inner trees, selected poems of you on Gaul, and that's a picture of him. Great picture of him when he was a little bit younger. Um, but the backstory um, for me and my association with Yvonne Gall is that many years ago now, not several, but it's been many years ago, I was down in Spartanburg visiting a friend of mine, John Lane, who a lot of you know, um, another poet and writer um, from our region. And um, I spent the night with him, and I was, he had a, a mattress on the floor of his study. And so I slept there. In the morning, I got up, and there were these. The walls were lined with bookcases, a lot like this. And I just got up and started looking through the bookcases, just trying to find something to read, look at, see what he had in his library. And just at random, I pulled out this skinny little book um, called "The Selected Poems of Yvonne Gall." That was published by a very small press in California uh, back in the early '60s, and started reading it. And I was just blown away. I mean, how, you know, it's one of those things when you, when you start reading somebody that you've never heard of and you can't imagine why you've never heard of them. And that happened almost immediately for me. And so I read the book. I asked him if I could borrow the book, take it home. I took it home. And as my good luck would have it, um, I live with a research library, yeah. a reference library. And so my partner, Nan Watkins, got... Uh, got on the ball and started, you know, trying to find out more about Yvonne Gall. Who is this guy? What's the story? Uh, how, could, how could such a great poet, you know, be un, unheard of, uh, more or less? And so what we came up with was, was amazing. Um, a lot of the work uh, was in French or German. Uh, we found access to French and German copies of some of his books. Uh, she ordered them. Um, we started looking at them, and w what it eventually led to was um, a copy of a book called, well, in English, Ten Thousand Dawns, uh, which were the love poems between Yvonne and his wife Claire over a period of 30 years, which is 10,000 days, um, that they wrote back and forth to each other, kind of like the Brownings. I mean, you know, there's, in literature, there's hardly anything like that. Uh, and we started reading these poems, and they're incredible. They're incredible. Um, Gall was is mainly known as a surrealist poet, and he is a surrealist poet at times. Um, and his history, I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction to give you more of a, you know, an inside uh, story of what his literary history is about. But we um, we found a copy in German and a copy in French, and so Nan translated. Uh, Claire's poems from the German, and I translated Yvonne's poems from the French, and we put them together, uh, uh, and and we found a publisher in um, White Pine Press up in New York, and they they did this book several years ago now, and 
it's a, I think it's a classic. I would call it a classic. Not only because it's love poems between a husband and a wife, but uh, the quality of the poetry is, is really remarkable. Um, so that's the first thing. And then uh, as time went on, um, I had a connection in Brazil with a Portuguese publisher and, and, and magazine editor. And I, I, they were doing a surrealist anthology uh, in Brazil. And, <clears throat> and they wanted my input on that. And I said, well, I've got a guy for you. Uh, and I turned them on to Yvonne Gall. And he ended up publishing a book called Fruit from Saturn in Portuguese and French, because it was written in the original French. Uh, this is a few years ago now. And he worked with Nan mostly on that, because Nan had, uh, Nan had the original, and, and they worked on, that, on this book. So Yvonne Gall started to come out you know, into the world, yeah. finally. Uh, and then Nan spent a couple years translating uh, Yvonne Gall's last book. It's called Dream Reader. Traumkraut. He wrote it in German, uh, but it's translated as Dreamweed. Uh, and the story behind this book um, is fascinating. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you about it, and then I'm going to read a little bit about it too in this introduction. But um, he was he was a pacifist. World War One. He goes to Switzerland. World War Two. He leaves Germany because of the Nazis and goes to Paris. Um, in Paris, you know, then the Germans invade Paris, the Nazis invade Paris, so he moves to America, he's in New York, um, and in all these places he's connected to everybody that anybody's ever heard of. Artists, writers, musicians, uh, he's one of the most well-connected literary figures that I've ever, I've ever known about. Um, and so, in America, after the world the war ended, uh, he developed leukemia. And so um, he eventually went back to Paris, or he was in the American hospital in Paris, uh, dying of leukemia. And he, had, you know, he would, had been writing on this last collection of poems for a while in America, but now he wanted to finish it. Um, he needed more white blood cells. Um, so all the great artists in Paris and France and Europe came to the hospital and donated their blood so that he could finish writing this book. So this book is full of some of the greatest artists of the 20th century. I mean, that's a, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it's too good. It's just too good. So that's, that's a little bit of the backstory uh, in terms of where I'm coming from. And, and uh, couldn't have done it without Nan Watkins, uh, who is the real, uh, the real reference person and the real translator in our household. I piddle around with French, but she, she knows languages backwards and forwards. Um, so anyway, uh, we won't be here all night, but I, I'm just going to read a, um, a few sentences from the introduction just to give you some details on this guy's life. Because it's been, it's my job. I feel like as a poet, as a literary person, when you find something or somebody like this, it's part of the job is to get help them get out there, put them out there. Uh, and uh, it's been kind of my uh, one of my um, what do you want to say um, missions uh, to to get Gaul into the English speaking world as much as I can. Uh, so, let me just read you a few sentences here. It says, Yvonne Gall was one of the great lyric poets and authors of the 20th century. He was born in 1891 in Alsace-Lorraine, which gave him a fluency in both French and German. He was active in both French and German pacifist circles during World War I and lived among other exiles in Zurich, Switzerland in 1917. Gall was in the avant-garde of various literary scenes from the beginning a central figure in the world of Dada in Zurich and German Expressionism in Berlin alongside Hans Arp and George Gross in the early 20th century. Um, and he subsequently moved to Paris in 1919. There, inspired by Apollinaire, he joined forces with Eulard as a founder of the French Surrealist movement. Yvonne Gall's Manifesto of, for Surrealism included here and translated for the first time in English by Nan Watkins, appeared simultaneously in October 1924 
with André Bertrand's first Surrealism Manifesto. During Gall's life, he published books of poetry illustrated by artists including Picasso, Leger, Dali, Brock, Chagall, Tanguy, and the list goes on. An agent for Rhine Verlag, Gall brokered with Joyce the first German translation of Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. As well as being a preeminent poet and translator, Gall was a playwright of enormous influence. His plays, such as Methuselah, um, were the foundation upon which Ionesco built his Theater of the Absurd and the launch pad for Artaud's Theater of Cruelty. He is probably best known as a poet for his love poems. Uh, translations by numerous American poets include W.S. Merwin, Kenneth Rexroth, Robert Bly, William Carlos Williams, Kenneth Patchen, and Galway Connell. Gall immigrated to the United States in 1939 at the time of the Nazi invasion of France during World War II, living at the center of the city's artistic life along with fellow immigrants Mark and Bella Chagall. In New York, he became the celebrated editor of Hemisphere's magazine, through which he published the work of French and American poets, including Kenneth Rexroth, Henry Miller, William Carlos Williams, Andre Breton and Philip Lamontilla. Um, during these years, he befriended William Carlos Williams, James Laughlin of New Directions, and Kenneth and Miriam Passion, among others. Um, and he became an American citizen. Uh, in, after the war, Yvonne contracted leukemia, and he and Claire returned to France in 1947. During his last weeks in the American hospital outside of Paris, where he wrote the bulk of his opus, Trump Crowd. Um, Gall quite literally survived on blood donated by fellow poets and artists upon finishing the text for the book that would ultimately secure his reputation as a poet in both Germany and France. Uh, Gall died on February 27, 1950. He was 52 years old. The principal reason for his lack of fame in the U.S. and in English-speaking countries abroad is that very little of his work until very recently has been translated into English and those translations were done in small run limited editions. So my selections here are in chronological sequence, uh, citing many of Gaul's most important poems written during the all too short arc of his life. So um, that in a nutshell is kind of the guy I'm talking about. Uh, there's a lot more detail of course and if you're interested uh, talk to Nan. She's got the best Gaul reference library in the world. Not just in Silva. We're talking the world. <laughs> if anybody should write Gaul's biography, it's Nan Watkins. Um, so I'm just going to read a couple things out of the book. I've selected a, um, just a, a little bit from the Surrealism Manifesto. Um, everybody knows French Surrealism and the name Breton. Um, I don't think Breton wrote the first Surrealism Manifesto. I think Gaul beat him to it. But it was very close in time, within probably a week or two of each other. Uh, but their, their take on surrealism is, surrealism is very, very different. Um, and Br their personalities are very, very different. Uh, Gaul, I mean, uh, Breton was um, pretty much an egomaniac, whereas Gaul was a very, you know, shy, almost shy, a very composed person. Um, so there was, and there was an immediate clash between, between the two groups. I mean, it was Apollinaire and Eulard and Gaul and some others, and then there was Breton and and his cadre of people who are all the ones that got all the, the media play and hype and, and that you hear about, but you don't hear about the other side. So here's, here's from Gaul's manifesto. He says, reality is the basis of all great art. Without it, there's no life, no substance. Reality is the ground under our feet and the sky over our head. Everything the artist creates has a point of departure in nature. The Cubists in the beginning were well aware of this, as humble as the purest primitives. They bowed down before the simplest, most worthless object. This transposition of reality into a higher artistic plane constitutes surrealism. Breton and fake surrealism, which some of the ex dadaists have invented to continue to shock the public, will quickly disappear from the scene. They affirm the absolute power of the dream, and make of Freud a new muse. Their psychic mechanism based on the dream and the random play of thought 
will never have the power to destroy our physical organism, which teaches us that reality is always right, that life is truer than thought. Our surrealism rediscovers nature, the primal human emotion, and strives with the help of a completely new artistic medium toward a structure, a purpose. Now, for any of you that have ever read Breton's Surrealist Manifesto, that, uh, this is very, very different. And, and one of the things I loved about Gall's poetry from that first experience, the, taking the book off of John Lane's shelf, was the way he uses nature in his poetry. I mean, it's full of nature, uh, images and metaphors, uh, and, and done in kind of surreal but beautiful ways. And so what I thought I would do would be read a few of the poems to you, and you'll see what I'm talking about. You know, and his, his poems, although surrealistic, are, are always grounded. There's always either a theme or a, uh, a point he's trying to make or an emotion he's trying to convey, whereas the, the Breton surrealists, uh, you can't make head or tails out of it. It's, it's kind of like a stream of consciousness um, dreamscape. Uh, so so these are, I'm going to read a few poems from, from the 10,000 Dawns book because, to, to me, those are my favorites. Uh, and as, as others have said uh, before me, uh, they think that you know, he'll be remembered for his love poems in the end. So he's writing to his wife, Claire, and he writes, Your hair sets fire to the largest burning light of the century. Your brow is the blackboard on which the secrets of men are scrawled. Your eyes are two diamonds glued into the face of the Sphinx. Your neck is an Eiffel Tower painted in pink. Your lips are twin boats that dance on the Red Sea. Your teeth are lined up like the keys of my piano. When you speak, the acacias bloom, ten creeks laugh, and when you walk, everything swings. <laughs> It doesn't get much better than that, folks. <laughs> you want to impress your girlfriend, here it is. <laughs> you can tell her you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another one. Um, I want to be that birch tree that you so love. I would have a hundred strong arms to protect you. A hundred thousand green and gentle hands to caress you. I would have the best birds in the world to wake you up at dawn and console you at night. I would pour you from the petals of the sun in summertime. I would wrap your fe fearful dreams in my shadow. I want to be that birch tree who carves out your grave with its roots in order to embrace you again and again. That's a sexy poem. <laughs> so um, the backstory on Claire and, and Yvonne is, is enormous. And um, it, both of them were not without their affairs. Claire is known for her affairs. Gall, not so much, because not a lot of people know about him. But um, he, had, he had an occasional affair as well. So they, their, their relationship was off and on again. It was more on than off. But there were periods when they were estranged. And, and, um, and all during these periods, they were writing these love poems back and forth to each other, either trying to explain what they'd done or apologize or lure the other one back or whatever. You know, I mean, there's a, there's a, a whole bunch of this. So here's, here's one. He's writing to Claire. And obviously, they're having, they're having problems. Um, and he writes, I wear you like a tattoo, your smile on my eyelids, on my lips is etched each of your kisses. The acid of your tears is burning my shirt collars, and your letters that will last forever have filled up my suits. Tattooed against all their advances, why do you even care that other women would want to sell me love? 
I don't think he got away with that one. <laughs> but he had a comeback, and Claire writes back to him, and that's in the book too, and then translated Claire's. Uh, so Claire writes back, and, those, and then Gall comes back again with another poem. This is the season of jealousy. My eyes drop like leaves from the fall of my life. Rain strokes my hair with widowed hands. Sister Sorrow, sitting on the boot of my car, cry for me. Iron and lead are not as heavy as love. He's taking a different tack now. He's <laughs> yeah, and it worked. <laughs> it worked this time. So then there's, there's a lot of other poems. But then at the end, you know, he's dying of leukemia. And, um, and, and most of Trom Crowd is, it's a, dark, it's a pretty dark book because, you know, he's a young guy. He's had a great life and he wants to continue. Uh, but he knows he can't. And so, you know, there's most of the poems... It, are, are, are trying, he's trying to embrace this reality that, that he's not going to live much longer and, and, and what, what does that mean and where do I go and all the questions that we ask ourselves as we get to a certain age. Um, so he writes, Oh, I want to complain about the owl who knocks on the doors of night, always dressed in autumn, fed on moldy old stars and bound to thousand-year-old trees. I want to complain about the smart owl who fakes eternal pain while making love, or cries like the root of all evil, who with a million wounds pours out all his white blood. In the cold night, you listen to my complaints, but can't you hear my heart near you beating to the drum of death? So he's talking about leukemia, and he's talking about dying, and he's trying to um, connect with Claire in these last last days. And so then the, the title poem of the 10,000 Dawns book, it's called, well, the, he doesn't title his poems, but it's the title poem for, for that book of love poems. So, and this may be my favorite Gaul poem. It's, it's one of those things where somebody asks you, who's your favorite poet? You can't answer that. I mean, you know, there's just too many great poets. Uh, same with Gaul, you know, what's your great, what's your favorite Gaul poem? But if I had to pick one, this is the one I'd pick. Ten thousand dawns, my angel, ten thousand dawns. Ten thousand times the eye of the sun has come to open again our eyelids. Ten thousand dawns for this one night of our love. Your head sculpted in my arms the rose garden of your hair on fire with 10,000 red roses. Oh, what fireworks and the 10,000 voices of waves. How many moons have passed, delirious or sad, covering us with the ecstasy of snow. And of old men who have lent us their eyes, and of children who have eaten our hearts in the 10,000 dreams of love. Ten thousand dawns, my angel, ten thousand dawns. Ten thousand eggs filled with birds and their songs. Ten thousand sun yokes, more than make up for this death of a hundred thousand stars. So, Yvonne Gall, everybody. <laughs> he's, he's the man. If I had to pick one poet of the, from the 20th century, he'd be the guy. Because, and this book is a, is a real composite of the, the variety of the different voices and forms and styles that he wrote in. And he mastered all of them. I mean, there's not one form or one book that you can really find fault with. I mean, some of them are harder to get into because, number one, they were written in German or French. Um, and, um, and some of it has a lot of metaphysical implications or, you know, uh, metaphors and, and images in it. But uh, it's, it's, all, it's all first class, first rate stuff. So, um, Yvonne Gall. So, 
you guys are getting two for one tonight. <laughs> how how often in a in a writer's life you get two books coming out at the same time? <laughs> Number one, it's 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 unbelievable. Number two, it's a pain in the you know what? It's it's hard to promote two books at one time. You know, um, so I'm just doing them together tonight. You know, because I know most of you, and I want you to know about these books, and I like. I like to talk about both of them. Uh, they both have good backstories, uh, and they're both important in that way, in their own way. Um, the Gall book is something I'm doing for this guy. It's somebody I found. It's a literary um, um, workscape. You know what 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 we do um, as as writers when we're not writing our own stuff. Uh, but the book Driving the Green Road is is my poetry, and the story behind this book is several months ago, back in the early fall, I get an email from a woman who I don't recognize her name, and she says, Thomas, I've decided to publish your book. And I'm thinking, who is this woman and what is the book she's talking about? <laughs> it turns out, I had come to find out, that a few years before, uh, I had sent a manuscript to, to this woman in her press. Um, and then she went out of business. So she wrote me almost immediately saying that um, she was going to shut down her press and the, so she couldn't publish my book. And so I forgot about it. So she writes me and I didn't remember even sending it. And uh, so she reminded me and we found the manuscript. She had a, um, a, a I sent her a printed copy. I didn't have a, a digital copy of the book, the manuscript. So we had to kind of put it back together again, you know, from scratch, from what she had. And I didn't like really what I'd sent her by then, you know, three years ago. <laughs> by then. So, so we, we worked it out and, and re-edited it and, and, and fixed it into a book that really we really felt good about. Um, and this, these poems were all written um, during uh, Nan and Mai's visit to um, Scotland, Ireland, and Wales back in the 1990s and early 2000s. I made a couple trips uh, in the early 2000s on my own for other books, um, one, of, one of which was the anthology I did called Writing the Wind, um, uh, Celtic Resurgence, it, the new Celtic poetry, which is all contemporary Celt poets writing in their Celtic, indigenous Celtic languages. Um, so it's not one of these things, but like, you know, 100 years ago, there were all these people writing all this stuff. These are people who, for the most part, are still alive. A few of them have left us, but um, they're still, and they're still writing in, in Gaelic and Scots Gaelic and Irish and uh, Cornish and, and um, Welsh, Manx. Um, so this has never been done. And so the, the time that I spent uh, two summers in, in, in Wales, Ireland, and Scotland, in the 90s, you know, I was connecting with these people and learning about, you know, Welsh poetry tradition and the Irish poetry tradition, the Scottish poetry tradition. And this crazy idea to do this book came out of those visits and took two or three years to do it. And I had help from people in all the countries, uh, you know, gathering the material from the people who were writing in their indigenous language. And we finally put that book together. Um, so. That was that story, and, and, and during, during the years, uh, the summers that we were there, uh, it, we, we lived in Larn for two summers. Um, and it took, because the original reason for us going to Larn was because of Nan and Mai's love for Dylan Thomas. Uh, Nan had been to Larn with her sister in previous years, and I had never been. And I was kind of uh, hit a low in my uh, in, in my literary consciousness, I needed some inspiration. I needed something to, you know, bring me back to life. And uh, so Dylan was my hero. I mean, is all, of all the poets writing in English, he was the guy that I admired the most. And so we decided, let's just go to Lauren and see what Dylan was all about. Because all his poems are full of, of images from, from that place. He was a place poet. And so uh, we figured, well, if we go there, we'll learn about Dylan and all the images and his poetry and, and we'll get to talk to people that knew him and you know it may be just exactly what what I needed to bring me out of my funk so we went there we met these wonderful people who let us stay in their bungalow um, for as long as we wanted 
and became very close friends with them. We're still very good friends and talk to them all the time. Um, but the second summer that I was there, I got this crazy idea. I thought, maybe I can write from the Dylan Thomas boathouse and I can channel Dylan Thomas. <laughs> These things happen, folks. You go, you go, over, the, you go over the edge sometimes. You know? So I went, I went to the, the uh, offices of the, the, offices of the, the government, the cultural services or the cultural whatever it was called, um, and, and, and got an appointment with the, with the head guy walked in his office and I, I, I laid down this idea. I said, is there any way that I might be able to use the Dylan Thomas's house, which was a historic landmark, uh, to, to write some poems? And I, and I told him who I was and, you know, I'd been there the two summers before and there were a lot of newspaper articles that had been written about me and everything, so I brought all this stuff, you know. And, you know, almost immediately he says, oh, oh okay. It was, it was almost like, you know, it was so outrageous that he didn't really think about it, you know. <laughs> Instead, he just answered. And so, I, I, you know, I signed this, this waiver that said if I, you know, fell and broke my leg, I wouldn't sue the <laughs> Welsh government and all that kind of stuff. But, they, you know, it's, it's a tourist attraction, and it's open from 9 o'clock in the morning till 5 in the afternoon every day. And so the deal was that I could go there in the morning before they opened for, for the tourists, and I could go there in the evening after they closed it up. And they gave me a key. Right. So I could use it anytime I wanted. <laughs> and so I started writing poems in the Dylan Thomas Boathouse. And damned if I didn't get some Dylan Thomas. <laughs> Not a lot, but I swear he was there. I swear it. I <laughs> So anyway, this is this is a book called the Larn Poems, and these are the poems that I wrote in Larn and from the Dylan Thomas Boathouse um, in those two summers. Um, just a couple a couple poems from that to give you an idea. Um, if I can find them, this isn't the one I was going to read from, but that's all right. Wrong book. Okay, this, this poem is a poem that I wrote in um, the graveyard in St. Martin's Field, the church there in, in, in Larne. Um, literally wrote it there by Dylan's grave. Um, you know, I, I had this idea, if you, if you go to the grave, you might have a better chance of channeling Dylan Thomas. If you go to the boathouse, you, you know, and I, and I went to all these places where he hung out. He went to the Browns every night and had beers. We went to the Browns every night to have beer. I mean, you know, so there's a poem about the Browns in here. There's a poem about the graveyard. <laughs> uh, so this one's the one that's called At the Grave in St. Martin's Field. Beneath the hedge-covered hills and hillsides, Rooked with cows in a cloud-built sky, calling for rain. The wind whispers your name, along with the names of trees and grasses, the fox and the curlew, that call to you to come out and play again with the children of the mothers of Larne, as words, and the breath behind windows as mist on the river Tav, as bright as the daydreaming daylight, or palms from the mouth of rooks, as simple as it is to die back into life from a thought as sweet as a song or Caitlin's kiss where we all weep from the neither here nor there of you running through ferns and lying in word beds of leaves that when laid out like a poem in its grave on a hillside you will see what was missing in a metaphor wanting you to live here forever and never grow old. Wow. So a lot of a lot of the poems, I mean Dylan's poems is the poems are totally lyrical, every single one of them. I mean he was all about his parents wouldn't let him learn English. I mean Welsh, and his father was a Welsh. They were both fluently Welsh speakers, and his father taught English in, in Welsh in the school systems in uh, in Swansea, but they wouldn't let Dylan learn Welsh because they knew he they knew of his talent from when he was little. And they, and they nurtured his talent, but they knew that if he wrote in Welsh, nobody would ever hear of him. You know, a few people in Wales, you know, and that's kind of the way it is with the Welsh speakers. There's some great poets in Wales, uh, but nobody outside of Wales has, has heard of them because they write in Welsh. 
Um, so he, he, you know, he started writing in English at, at an early age, and um, but he, but he was so in love with Wales and the Welsh traditions and, and some of the older Welsh poets uh, that his, his poems are really lyric, the way that Welsh is lyrical, and he writes in a, a lyrical style uh, that is practically song. Um, so. This, this, and, uh, yeah, and, and all of, almost all of his images are from what he sees. He's just, you know, he's just writing it, writing it as he sees it. But he was a meticulous rewriter. I mean, to the point of being almost absurd. Uh, you would think by reading his poetry, it was just stream of consciousness, and it just all came out in a flood, and he never went back and messed with it. But he tinkered with words, with days. He would take days, and he had these word lists that were long for each poem, you know, and he would be selecting, you know, he was meticulous. And I, that, that's kind of shocked me, because I, I wouldn't have thought that by just reading his poetry. But this is a poem that I wrote in the boathouse, and it's the closest, one of the closest things that I came to, what I could claim if I were to say that I was channeling Dylan. Um, I was copying Dylan in a way, I was copying his rhythms and his lyric, uh, but this all just came out. I mean, I wasn't Trying real hard like he was. It just came in a flash uh, one, one morning. So it's called What Birds? What birds at daybreak break into song in the sun, stealing my sleep from the ink of ages and the papyrus pages washed up on a beach of sound, sand sounding of gulls? What birds past daybreak come to my roof like the rooks and the doves to dance? to prance on my ears, denying the daylight and the dream of ale, dying of silence. What birds in morning mew like magpie in the bloody trees or the hedge of milk, making like late breakfast to the clock tower bells, burning of music? What birds at midday chaff or sneeze at the hill high sun, rising like Icarus was cormorant, diving into the July blue sky, and seeing only dabs of air, drowning of numbers. What birds before tea time bleat their bleeding heart a song, quicker than swallow, crazy as curlew, like words swimming through ages, like a place on my pages, moody of heartbreak. What birds at dusk dart like wrens to castle walls, calling to crow and calling it jackdaw, that itches my eardrum like the letter R in place of a vowel howling of innocence. What birds in heron darkness roar at the moon or hawk, nesting in cliff rock near cockle gone tide, higher than gorse grass, higher than hills, as I breach one more thought of ink into the crying dark of day, drinking of bitters. What birds at daybreak break into nuisance in my thick brown sleep, muddy with mating in a raven's nest of nothing more than a nod at the balm of day from my fiddling or frolic through fern beds of fantasy, dreaming of reverie. I can't read like Dylan, but the rhythms are there. I mean, the rhythms are there. And, uh, if only I could read like Dylan Thomas. Wow. Um, so that's Wales. Um, and this book's divided into three sections, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Um, the next section is Scotland, and they published some really great pictures, great pictures of a fast a, a um, house in Scotland. Uh, in the first section, in the, in the Wales section, it starts with a picture of um, the coast, the southwest coast, um, down near St. David's, and a picture of Nan sitting on the cliffs looking out over the ocean. Another beautiful picture in a beautiful part of Wales. Um, so, Scotland. Um, backstory on Scotland is that um, my Scottish genealogy is on both sides of my family. I'm Scottish. I'm twice double Scottish on my mother's side. Um, Macdai, which is Clan Davidson, and McGregor uh, would be my grandfather's side. Um, 
And it turns out that my father, this is my mother's side, my father's side, he claims to be English and his name is Dawson. But if you trace back the roots uh, in genetic um, genealogy, um, Dawson also goes back to the Scottish uh, and, and uh, to um, Clan Davidson. Um, so uh, the Jackdaw, Jackdaw, son of David, son, um, um, Daw, son. Uh, it's, yeah, my father, he didn't want to be Scottish. He wants to be English. But he's Scottish, whether he likes it or not. <laughs> so anyway, so that, this is a poem. Uh, it was written in Glen Finnan, um, which is the place where Bonnie Prince Charlie landed when he was trying to unite the clans in the Jacobite Rebellion. Um, and they've got a big monument there, and, and it's a beautiful, beautiful place. A lock coming in, the mountains all around, and a really, really great place. And we stayed there for a couple of days. And this poem is called Glen Finnan, and it, it refers to my, my ancestry and Bonnie Prince Charlie. Where water goes through gorse grass, and a wee glen and a red deer wakes, and a burn of birch and green, Green riding down the highland hills from Glenfinnan, or rails pulled by a gluttony of steam, steam steeper than the slopes worn down by the smoke-like mist of rain, and my mind that runs like salmon upstream to get to the source, like the seed of my ancestral blood spilled by Stuart and Cameron on the inch of Perth, burning like peat and my heart afire here in these hills, feeling like a lover feels at home with the man she loves as I do Scotland. And what Lorca must have meant by green, 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 how I love you, green. Green hills and the river wren whistling over my shoulder in the birch while I sit by white river rocks training my ink to talk, too tired from walking all day. So I sit and write to the tune of the wind and water in my ears a mile or two from where the Bonnie Prince set foot on shore to give Scotland back a king the way my blood boils with the sons of David and ears ache with the name of King robbed from MacGregor and the health of farms. But I am back, back from the boondocks of the clearances and the hard as briarwood hearts of the West, back to the white bark of trees and ferns in a wee glen where the wren throws back its head and voice that can be heard in the stem of thistle and in the heart of heather here by this burn, a stone's throw from lock, where wind is lord of this heaven called Castle Keep, where like Charlie, I plant my flag in the peat black earth and write. So the reference to um, Sons of David. I mean, Clan MacDai is is, is 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 son. I mean, the Mac is son, son son of, of David. And who is David? Uh, King David of the Bible. That's who it is. Because the the Celts and the people from that part of the world came up into that part of the country and settled and um, did their own brand of conquering. Um, and um, so, in my mind, I'm related to the people from the Bible, King David. I mean, Davidson. And it, that's, that's really the bloodline. It goes back to that, to that, that migration from the, from the south down in the Middle East. Um, that's where the name comes from. And also, if you're related to King David, you're also related to Jesus. <laughs> because Jesus was from... Uh, the, he was the son of Preach David. Preach it, brother. Preach it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, I've always been curious about Jesus. Who was that guy? And You know, if you're related to somebody, you want to know who they were. <laughs> He's your brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way I feel about it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, call me crazy. I am. Uh, <laughs> So, um, one more poem from Scotland, well, one and a half. Um, this is a poem I, I met a lot of people in Scotland too, I mean the, the Celtic, um, Scots, Scottish Gaelic writers, 
And probably the most well-known of the contemporary Scottish Gaelic writers, Scots Gaelic writers, is a, is a guy who's from the West Coast. Most of the Gaelic speakers and writers are from the West Coast, in Ireland and Wales and Scotland. Um, and there's a good reason for that. But um, he's, a, he's a fellow who I met in Edinburgh named Angus McNichol. And um, he, he is the man. Uh, he's about my age now, and, um, and he's probably the most well-known Scots Gaelic poet in Scotland. And after I, after I met him and we talked, spent time together, um, and this was, this was right at the beginning of the time when they were starting to talk about secession from England, from Great Britain. Uh, that all happened later in the vote, and they didn't make it, and it's still going on, but this was in the earlier years. And so the Gaelic, you know, the people who were still speaking the, the language and, and writing in the, in the language were very much in favor of, of, of secession. They wanted, they wanted to go back to the way it was and for the English to leave them alone. Um, so this is a poem for Angus McNichol called The Call. In the high-handed hills or the right-handed rain, for all of us collectively going insane, for the fields now gone that used to give peat, to the fields taken over for man's love of meat. To the tops of the mountain, to the floors of the sea, the tide is now shifting, for big become we. The bell it has sounded, the alarm it has rung, the music is written, the song it is sung. The cities are crowded and the towns they're full, mankind tired of commerce and tired of rule. So lads, take up the standard and take up the kilt. Use the, can the tam as a capstone and bring back the lilt. For the day is a coming and the day will arrive when we will reclaim our homeland and bring the dead back alive. <laughs> That's probably from the 60s. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> One more rant. <laughs> yeah. And then there, there was, I was over in um, St. Andrews on one of my trips in 2004 uh, when I went alone. And, and um, we're sitting in a pub, me and some fellows I went with. Um, and the uh, waitress comes to our, our table and, you know, take our order. And so I ask her, you know, what's your best single malt? You know, I didn't know. <laughs> you know, I, I knew what single malt was, but that's about it. Um, and so she looked at me like I was absolutely insane. And so she didn't say a word. She just went like this. And so I got up out of my seat, and I followed her around and into the, where the bar was. And there's a big, long bar and a wall, three or four shelves, about 15, 20 feet long filled with single malt, <laughs> all different brands. Wow. And, and she says, take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you heathen American. <laughs> so anyway, this is the poem I wrote about. It's called Single Malt. What is your best single malt? The American asked the waitress in the St. Andrews pub. Come with me, she replied, smiling as if the man had just asked her which country he was in. Now, here is our best Scotch whiskey, she said as they approached the bar, pointing to three long shelves stacked with bottles from end to end. Which do you fancy? Pick any one you want. <laughs> Scots are proud of their single bottles. <laughs> and they should be. They should be. Okay, then Ireland. Um, Another great picture uh, that they used at the beginning of the Irish section. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the green road, uh, driving the green road. And, and um, it's some incredible roads that are, you know, really just driving through the countryside with these stacked uh, rock walls along the sides, you know, that they've, they've taken out of the fields so that they can grow stuff. Uh, just dry stacked walls everywhere up the sides of mountains, and I mean, up crazy places, but along the roads especially. And this poem, is, I mean, this picture is a great one with tire tracks going up through the grass and then the 
rock walls on both sides. You know, only wide enough for one car. Um, so um, during during that um, first visit, well, the second visit actually, um, in 1995, um, Nan and I went to to the more western part of, of Ireland. Um, uh, spent most of our time in the west because that's where my people are from. They're from up the, from the highlands, and so I wanted to really get a, a you know a heavy dose of the highlands. And it's incredibly a lot like where we are right here. I mean, I woke up in the morning one morning and I thought I was back in in Jackson County. I mean, I really did. I thought you know uh, until I figured out where I was. But I mean, the, the, the landscape is, is remarkably similar um, in the climate, uh, everything, the people. Um, so we were out, out on the west coast in, in County um, Sligo where Yates was buried. And uh, this is a poem, everywhere we went, we tried to you know, hit the high spots you know, um, where great writers and artists you know, had been or lived or died or whatever. And, and the, the cultural centers and try to really take in um, the culture of these places, the heritage. And so this is a poem I wrote at Yates's grave um, on his birthday on June the 13th in 1995. Under the chin of Ben Bulban and under the old elms, under first blue sky of summer, and under these stones, you lie casting a coal eye on what passes for and passes by this church, fathered and grandfathered, wived and midwived by George and Claire's tower, with a tower here across the lane, spires reaching in the cold Irish night toward what heat was missing in a war, waged by compassion rather than greed, waged for stillness rather than speed, like lake waters lapping on a shore, like said the raven, nevermore, and cast a cold eye too on life as you lie there next to me come all this long way only to idle and die near a grave marked with a full moon 130 years on a birthday this day when I arrive. We have all come and gone over these stones, over this grass at Ben Bulban's feet, where any of us would want at last to lie. Yet here we've met, and I, a horseman, pass by. Another one of my heroes, Yates. Um, and so this is the title poem, Driving the Green Road. And if I'm putting you guys to sleep, let me know. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get into this stuff and, and, to, and, and to remove yourself from it because every time I read a poem or start talking about these journeys, it takes me back there. And these were really, really uh, fun and important times of my life, maybe some of the most important times of my life and journeys. Uh, so when I, when I get back into the poetry or the books, you know, it takes me right back and, I'm, you know, I, I want to be there. I mean, of course, I want to be there. So this is the poem called Driving the Green Road, and it's a poem dedicated to Joan O'Flynn, who's a good friend of Nan and mine's, who lives in Dublin. And she lived here in Jackson County for a couple of years. Um, long story. Um, but she went back home, and, and when we went to Ireland, she, she knew we were coming. She said, well, come stay with us, you know, which is the way that the, the Irish, especially the Irish, do. Uh, but, but the Welsh and the Scots, too, they're just, you know, hospitable beyond belief in, in most cases. So she says, come and stay with us, and we did. And so we, we did Dublin, uh, but then she says, come on, let's go somewhere else. Let's get out and, and really, I'll show you what this country really is like. So she drives all the way from Dublin to the West Coast, which isn't that far, but, uh, and we go out, um, out, on the, out near the coast in the County Clare. And um, she's driving us around, you know, showing us the countryside of west, western part of Ireland. And so this is the poem, Driving the Green Road. A fork in the road. The sign to the south says Gort. To the north are the Aran Islands and Inishman. 
but there's another road that is smaller and without paint. Let's go this way and get lost, our friend says, and takes her foot up from the brake. On nothing but gravel and gray dirt, we move through limestone fields, like a ball of wind whipping across the face of the moon. There are small wildflowers growing through unseen holes in stone, where the rain made art out of ancient rock. The road goes on. The gray dirt road has turned to green, grass growing under the wheels, where there is a mountain and a rain-soaked field, an old farm, where an old man, too simple to know words, stands in the door to his house shouting at our car, like Yates, horsemen, we pass by. Up there, we think he says, pointing toward the green road and into the bushes and a few trees. Feeling more lost than the old man's words, we go on. Lost and with no map to get to the next town, we get out and walk down the green lane, looking for a track that will take our car. But this road is now only for black and white dogs, for mm -hmm. sheep and an old cow too old for milk, for flowers that run ahead like rivers of yellow and white. In about a mile, we find ourselves in a field of grass, bordered by gray stone walls, a howling wind, and a weathered old tree. In the distance, the green road continues to the sea, away from religion and the world of noise, away from governments of tight wound time, where the green road ends, and there is ocean as far as the eye can see. Ocean on a green road that goes nowhere, in a land that yearns to be Ireland and free. Wow. And most of those people really want to be free. <laughs> <laughs> they do. And this is the last one, I promise. I promise. So this is the, this is a short poem that, that I wrote uh, at the Dublin station, leaving, leaving Ireland for the last time. Well, not the last time, but in 1995 during our, our summer, you know, over there. And Nan and I are getting on the train and we're going back to Wales. And uh, it's called Waiting for the Train. I sit on the highest hill in downtown Dublin waiting for the train. Where will we go now as we leave this ancient land? Not wanting to leave, we climb up into the train. All aboard? And it's as if all of this island were packed in our bags, every bit of peat and rock, every inch of rain, all the songs that are so thick in the air the dubs call it wind. Down the tracks, the streets of Onlar are turned, in, are turned to pasture and grass, the roads to walls of stone. Across an open field, an old tower reaches up as if to puncture the tire of early night. Punctuation and a loud noise at the end of this dream we have driven these past three weeks like a man's hands across the body of a red-haired girl that moans a song like the first breath of a piper goes into his pipe and blows up his bag called Ireland. <laughs> so, enough. <laughs> Enough of my indulgence. Uh, now it's your turn to be indulgent. I mean, do you ha if you have any questions, if you have any things you'd like to share from your trips to that part of the world. I know some of you have been there, have your own stories, maybe have some connections with some of the things that I've uh, remembered in, in the poems and what I've talked about, or um, anything you'd like to ask or say, anything. I enjoyed your presentation very, very much, but I just want to say this is on a totally different subject. I think I heard this morning that today would be Walt Whitman's 200th birthday. I'm not sure that's right or not. You might want to check. I mean, not. Is that true? Angela? Yeah, he's, he's Gemini. And <laughs> oh, we are. Yes. Well, Today's the 31st. Yeah. Okay. But didn't have to start. Dylan's was the other day. Uh, but any, and also, one other thing, I don't know, uh, Billy Collins, some years back, was a. United States Poet Laureate. I don't know if you've ever heard him. He used oh, to be yeah. on Garrison Keillor's uh, Prairie Home Companion. But he wrote uh, one of his 
poems is called, actually the book is called The Trouble with Poetry. And he says the trouble with poetry is it makes you want to write more poetry. <laughs> <laughs> so, He's right. <laughs> but, you know, he enjoyed what you had read. And it's, a, it's a kind of genetic addiction. I mean, for those of us who write, and I, there's a lot of us in this room, um, you know what I'm talking about. It, it, you can't stop. I, I went to a neurologist about a year ago for a back thing, and he had to fill out all these forms and everything. And he's reading the forms, you know, and he comes to the end and <clears throat> says, you know, occupation. And I had written retired on, on my occupation you know, uh, line in, in the form, right? which is what I do when I file my taxes. <laughs> um, he looks at me and he says, I didn't think writers ever retire. <laughs> and I had to tell him, I said, you're right. You don't know when it's you don't know when it's going to happen, and you don't know when you're going to stop. I mean, you're not really in control. It's, it's a kind of a magical addiction of sorts. It's not really an addiction. It's a compulsion. But that's good. I mean, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. What happened to uh, Claire Gall? Claire Gall, well, Yvonne died, you know, when he was 52 in 1950 in, in Paris, but Claire lived for 20, 27 yeah. years? Yeah. 27 more years. And she took, just like um, Mary and Patchen did with Kenneth Patchen's archive, she kind of took control of Yvonne's um, oeuvre in his archive and had books published and, and um, really promoted his work in France. She lived in France. I think she was the rest of the time, wasn't she in France? Yeah. And so a lot of the books were in French that were published up some of the manuscripts that you know hadn't been published in other languages or at all, and you know just kind of um, was the policeman for for his archives, and in some cases that was a good thing, in some cases it wasn't such a good thing, but I, I, we won't get into that. Um, but you know you have to give her credit for standing by her man and, and keeping his, his 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 work alive and and keeping the original stuff that's now all archived in Germany and France. I mean, they've got uh, uh, these large archives in both, both countries um, so that, you know, it's accessible. Um, and Nan has done a lot of work with those people. I'll just yeah. tell a little clear story. Um, Robert Blood and Galway Connell were both Jewish people. And They lived in Brooklyn Heights, right? Well, it's there. There it is. <laughs> Lackawanna algae. So she gave Galway this stack of, of Lackawanna poems and said, please, please publish. And they have a very nice correspondence back and forth with each other in his archive. And uh, they did a beautiful edition of it. There's a uh, limited, and then the paperback that we can all afford. This book, I mean, the, the publisher really wanted to do this book. I mean, both of these books came out of the blue. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't um, trying to hawk this book to anybody. I hadn't done anything of the selected poems. The, the guy that did 10,000 Dawns had been several years, and he contacted me. He says, I've been reading the Gaul again and getting into the Gaul, and I'd really like to do a selected poems. Would you be willing to edit it? So it just came out of nowhere, and I said, oh, "Of course I would," and that's that's what happened. Um, but um, the Canal poems are in here, the translations, the Bly translations, the William Carlos Williams translations, the Patchen translations. Uh, the publisher got permission from all these people and their archives and the estates and all the places necessary to get permission, and so they're all in here. It's all in here. It's it's a real documented book of. Um, of, of Gaul's over 
I mean, it's not the whole thing, of course, but I mean, of some of his best books and and the best translations done by the most notable people. We really wanted those translations in here because of name recognition. I mean, the academic people and people that really know poetry, they would tend to look at the back cover and see all these names in bold. They're all in bold uh, on the back cover. It's, oh, well, he must be good enough. You know, if these guys, try, you know, if that's how it works. Uh, so for better or worse. Did, you said De Gaulle was impacted by fascism and uh, dictators relative to the First and Second World War. Did, did he comment on his, and do any poetry relative to his pacifism? Well, there's a lot of references to uh, aspects of fascism and dictatorship and um, you know, he, he was a pacifist, so there's a lot of pacifistic imagery in his poems. And Nan, did he write anything literal? I don't remember any, you know, like a book of essays or something. I don't remember there being anything <coughs> specifically to that subject. Um, he was an ardent pacifist and belonged to a number of different organizations, including Penn International Congresses and so on. And so he was you know, speaking out very much and on international radio, broadcasting across Europe, and, and of course he was blacklisted, he was Jewish, and he was blacklisted, so he couldn't write his German when he, you know, in the 30s, and so he could only write French, and it goes back and forth. But he, he was art past Are any yeah. of the original French and German texts in any of those um, no. translations? No, not Chinese the original. Books? No, no, no. Um, that would have made a big book. I mean, you know, publishers are always thinking about money and cost, and, and he spent a lot of money on this book, doing a lot of pictures. A lot of the original uh, covers for these books that have been translated are are in here for each section and that kind of thing. So it's a really nice book. I mean, it's visual too. And there's pictures of Gaulle and Claire and Chagall and some really great pictures and some drawings by Chagall of, of Yvon Gaulle. And there's, you know, a lot of artwork and things that go along with the poetry. So you get a visual impression as well as the poetic impression. Um, anything else? Yeah. What does Dreamweed refer to? Is that? I mean, yeah. Well, Nan translated the Dreamweed book um, from from the German, which is what um, Yvonne wrote it in. Never been translated into English, and um, she went round. I remember, you know, when she was going um, over the whole book, and they're trying to come up with the title. And the original word in German is Traumkraut, and you'll have to ask Nan. You know the the specifics of the German in terms of those references, but uh, in the end, she she came up with there were several possibilities, um, and one of the things that Gaul was doing, I mean, for the pain and the suffering he was going through at the end, was he was smoking marijuana, and so Traumkraut, Dreamweed, Weed. I mean, you know, there's all these things that come into play, but we don't we don't know really what he meant. Uh, by is, by is there a flower named yeah. that or something? No, like there's that. not a, a literal <laughs> flower, is there? Yeah. There is. Yeah, he talks Alasam. Alasam. That's all right. Read the book. But what so that's the <laughs> translation. <laughs> Green weed. So is Alasam a flower? Well, he no. has this, it's a fantasy. It's a, a flower fantasy, literally. And, and well, that's what, you know. Right. So it's kind of a, a dream. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that you know, dream we kind of covered several bases, right, and, right. and it, it's a good title. I mean, it just is a good title, and it it, it works in terms of Gaul. He he was a dreamer for real. You know, he was never doing one thing always. He was always trying new things and going new places. And uh, it was long surrealism day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Of all of all the surrealist writers, he's by far my favorite. 
He's the only one I can understand. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so there you have it, you know. Um, so anything else? <coughs> I've taken a lot of your time, but I don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> Except for go somewhere and get, get something to eat later. But, and you all are invited. We can go somewhere and, and party. I mean, that, that goes along with everything that I've been talking about. <laughs> Especially Ireland. You go to Ireland, those of you who've been to Ireland, that's all those guys do. They just party. <laughs> and luckily, they have about three pubs on every uh, block in yeah. Dublin. That's right. I, I've never seen a place with so many pubs, but I, I didn't see anybody who was what we used to call out of the way, or they were all. They, 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 you wouldn't know that they were drinking at all. They, they're just happy, happy people. And that's just who they are. Right, exactly. And luckily, you know, Guinness is pretty got a low alcohol content, so you can drink yeah, a lot of it. it. Yeah. And that's, you know, mainly what the you know that's, the Irish will drink the most is. Popular, yeah. Yes. So, it made a convert out of me. I'll tell you, I, I've got <laughs> Guinness in my refrigerator as we speak. <laughs> so, especially in the summertime. Well, thank you, Thomas. Yes. Um, we have books here that we'll be glad to sign for y'all. We have some light snacks, too, and I'm sure Thomas would be glad to talk to you individually. So thanks again, Thomas. Thank you.